day and welcome to the Build Me A Brewery podcast episode three. And if you haven't already, please make sure you have a listen to the introductory episode, which will give you a bit more insight into the main goals and content we'll be covering throughout this podcast series. And make sure you listen to our earlier episodes so you can become more progressively informed as the series develops. And also, please make sure you like our Facebook page, Simply Build Me A Brewery, and also visit our website, www buildmeabrewery.com.au and subscribe to our mailing list. We continue with the Meet the Brewer series where I sit down with co-founders and head brewers from six Sydney breweries to get their stories, insights and advice. In today's episode, I sit down with Managing Director Simon Osborne and Head Brewer Addy Fitter from the Rocks Brewing Company out in Alexandria. This was such a great and informative chat with both of these blokes who have years and years of collective experience between them in the brewing industry. Simon, he came from being an owner operator of a McDonald's here in Sydney and found his love for craft beer back in 2012 after meeting now former business partner Mark Feathers at Hearts Pub. After starting out bouncing around Gypsy and contract brewing, enabling them to build a, a solid brand, they eventually invested in stainless steel, which gave birth to the Rocks Brewing Company in 2013. As for Addy, he also had close ties to the Hearts Pub after being a regular there and, and finally landing a job behind the bar, soaking in all he could learn about good beer and, and also the local independent scene. He then jumped into the brewing world following Mark and Simon in their new venture with the Rocks as an assistant brewer and doing deliveries, cleaning and just doing whatever he can to to assist in the in the startup phase of the brewery. Uh, he then had a chance to spread his wings after having stints at other breweries, including Young Henry's and Wicked Elf, and, and then finally returning to the Rocks Brewing family earlier this year. Both guests clearly know their stuff, dropping gems of information left, right and centre on, on what not to do when starting out and commonly overlooked aspects of when planning your brewery. We also heavily dive into the world of gypsy and contract brewing, which is another great model to consider when starting out. So get your notepad ready and have a quick finger on the pause and rewind button as there is just too much information in this episode to digest in just one sitting. So without further ado, I do hope you all enjoy my chat with Simon and Addy from the Rocks Brewing Company. Once again, I'm out in Sydney's Inner West and I'm sitting down with Simon Osborne, uh, Managing Director of Rocks Brewing and Head Brewer Addy Fitter. Uh, thanks for coming along, guys. Yeah. G'day. Thank you. Well, you're absolutely welcome to be here. You guys gave us a bit of a, a, a guided tour of the uh, the brew house and you guys are, are brewing a, a nice Nipah today, is that Nipah, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're doing lots of things here at the brew house. We've got 20 taps. Um, Waiting for summer, and waiting for Gladys to uh, let us have more than ten per booking. Oh so right, fit three hundred people out there. Yeah. It'd be nice. Yeah. So, and 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 that's something I'd like to hear your thoughts as well about the uh, impact COVID has had on you guys, and how you've sort of try to adapt during that that process. So, um, but we'll get into that later. But sure. to to kick things off. Um, I don't know if who would like to go first, but uh, maybe Simon, um, maybe you want to kick things off by telling us about your craft beer roots, what you were doing before, uh, rocks. Yeah. Well, I met a guy in a pub in 2012. The pub was called Hearts Pub. Uh, good guy. Um, I wanted to buy part of his business. I've just been in McDonald's for 30 years as an owner-operator and tried to retire and couldn't sit on my hands. I was surfing every day and... My wife wanted me to go shopping and I did go get this, go get that, and I said no. And so I looked for some investments into other businesses and met this guy, Mark Feathers, good guy, and we talked about his pub, Hearts Pub, and I really love the place. And that's the first taste I've craft beer in 2013, and the first drink I had was uh, the Hangman. Uh, yep. And I loved it, absolutely loved it, and I loved the thought of it. And then Mark said to me, why not build a brewery? Um, long story short, by 2013, we were up and running. Um, we uh, put a lot of money into it. It was a good team, um, and uh, Bob's your uncle. We 
fired off like a firecracker. It was fantastic. Um, we built this place. Uh, it's seven years ago now, and it went off. Um, we sold uh, lots of beer. We had lots of parties. Uh, we had big. Uh, filled the courtyard down there, 300 plus people. Had a concert there once. We had a concert, the Beards. Oh, yeah, the Beards, Beards played their final show here. Ah, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, we got too big, too, too quick. And that's the best way to describe it. And we started uh, overspending on new equipment and things that we didn't need. And uh, things changed. So, and then, uh, relationships changed and all sorts of things like that and uh, I took over the business fully in October 2018 and here we are turned the big ship around mm. she had a few problems there um, getting too big too quick mm-hmm. uh, which is a big problem for a lot of people sometimes yeah it's something that I'm hearing from from a lot of brewery owners yeah yeah and uh, it was the biggest advice I'd had from my accountant before getting into this business if you get too big too quick you bills overtake you and they do and so you've just got to learn how to uh, what we say here at the moment is walk, crawl and then run and right now we're back in the walking stage and we've been open for seven years mm. but we're doing okay and this big ship is been turned around and guys like Addy and our uh, operations manager Zach and our wonderful business manager Scotty Morgan have uh, really turned us around yeah well that's great to hear and uh, um, like I said it you guys have played a very big part in um, a lot of the new breweries that have sprung up all over the inner west and Sydney at the moment, um, helping out with contract brewing and all that, which is a, a segment that I'd like to talk in a sure. bit more detail about. But, uh, um, Addy, uh, maybe talk a bit about your craft beer roots. Um, it's quite funny because it was very, I guess, um, a little bit similar to Simon and that it's sort of – Hearts was almost a bit of a gateway for me, but look, I uh, I grew up in England. Um, I just finished uh, university, and uh, we're at the peak of recession. Um, I have dual citizenship anyway, so I left and come to Australia. Um, my degrees in film and television production, and so I spent uh, like a couple of years sort of in that industry. Um, but I was a keen home brewer. Like I picked up on craft beer real quick and absolutely loved it. And, I think, uh, like, the beers I was drinking back then were, like, probably Carl Strauss, like, Tower 10 and things like that. And then I found Hearts and became one of the earliest members of the pub and was drinking in there all the time. Um, I went off and I was a camera operator for a while, but I couldn't afford to be drinking craft beer all the time, but I wanted to. Mm. So a friend of mine I was with was um, telling me that it was easy to brew beer. I mean, his home brew wasn't great. So I was like, well, if I spent a bit more time, figuring that out maybe I can make craft beer at home um, and I started making some decent beer um, and just had a heart change in my career and wanted to sort of follow my passion started as a bartender at Hearts Pub um, and then soon the, um, the boys there all noticed that I had a deep knowledge of craft beer and a big love for it and uh, as they started basically opening this place sorry I'm a deep love <laughs> oh yeah 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 <laughs> to drink drink Sydney yeah, love yeah exactly <laughs> uh, but yeah no I uh, <laughs> I basically came on board delivering beers for these guys and uh then we built this place and I started as a assistant brewer and sort of warehouse a warehouse guy so I was still um, delivering beers and doing a bit of the warehouse stuff down there and then I'd come back and finish off brews and stuff for the other brewers so I did that almost four years um, and then I left and went off to Young Henry's for two years um, which I just sort of my knowledge in brewing and my skills skyrocketed from there yep um, so that was under Richard out there, was it? All? Yeah, so the head brewer when I was there uh, was Benny Holstock. Um, uh, it's now Jesse, but I was, I was brewing with Jesse at that time. Uh, and then I left with the sort of goal of starting my own brew pub. Um, you know, business plans, putting everything in together, and you get to the point where I realized there wasn't, uh, I didn't have enough capital and it wasn't going to be enough for a while. Um, so I sort of directed my energies back into trying to become a head brewer somewhere and like work that way. Um, 
I know I know Sean very well at Wayward. He's the head brewer there, and he needed basically almost the same thing as when I started here, but brewing, doing some deliveries, and then um, one of their brewers went off to Germany, so I took it, took over for about six seven months as the brewer there, um, and that was great. I learned heaps there, lots about sours and barrel aging and stuff, and you know we were doing a bit of that here, but you can know, see Wayward's Wayward. Um, which was really cool. And then after that, um, I got picked up by Wicked Elf and I was their head brewer for about seven months. We released about, I think it was like four, four or five seasonals in a matter of four months. Um, just before Christmas, I was doing Meepers and West Coast IPAs, Watermelon Sour and Belgian Quad, some Nitro and all that sort of stuff. Um, and then did all the brewing for the bushfires, okay, yeah. um, which was pretty hectic. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I guess after that, I was down here um, slinging beers and just popped into these guys because I was around their neighborhood. I was like, oh, I can't see Simon and Scotty. I haven't seen them in years. Things were getting quiet at Wicked Elf as well. Um, there was two of us as head brewers there at that time. So I was sort of like, oh, okay. Um, popped in here and Simon was just like, you need a head brewer and we'd love to have you back. And yes, it's pretty you much. Did, you didn't mention that I told you to drive a car. <laughs> he, likes nor, to, he likes to say this, but no. Nor did you mention the fact that you nearly dropped a whole pallet of bottles on the road. I know it was majority <laughs> of a pallet of bottles on the road. Yeah, yeah. Was, was that was that auto or manual? We talked uh, manual. Yeah, yeah. He told me to drive stick because at the time I was an auto driver, and they're like, "Oh, here's your delivery vehicle," and I'm like, "Oh, we don't know how to do that one." Um, so yeah, this is a bit of time around the car park here and then off I went and then yeah we, we all had some some funny stories from the past of <laughs> very in like early days of gabs and all of that sort of stuff so it's I think I feel really privileged and I'm sure Simon does as well that to be part of the industry when it was so infantile um, and to remember those days of Sydney Craft Beer Week and the early gaps when they're out in Redfern and, um, you know, and seeing where it's gone now and having so many other like-minded people around us now, it's great. What what year would you say it um, sort of really did take off in the Sydney area where... So this, this place was uh, born in 2007, late 2007, started trading in 2008 and it was fired up when we opened up. The brewery industry was... Starting to fire in 2013. Mm. So we were making money before 2013 as gypsies. Mm. Um, and that really, and then and then we started losing money in 2013 when we were, we became our own brewery. Okay. So, and, and that's that's something that we need to, you know, consider. It's, you know, it's all good and well having all that shiny stainless steel down there and getting, you know, distracted by everything that's silver out there, but at the same time, it's it's got to be full mm-hmm. and it's got to be operating 24-7, basically. Yeah. We need it, we need it full. And, and the brewery here, are you operating on a 24-hour clock or no? No, well, fermentation, well, for, of course. Yeah, so brew, what brew what I mean, I think, is that we need to be in this place. We just need to be busy all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, we need to be looking towards our, our capacity um, because every time we sit by idle, that means that we've probably got staff that shouldn't be here. Yeah. And, and that's what we've been learning to do in the last 20, uh, 24 months. And because uh, I don't have production experience at whatsoever, but I know about it now, don't I? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, look, I think it's just keep keeping the fermenters full. It's the, it's not keep, as Andrew yeah. says, keep the sausage machine tight. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Moving on to, I guess, a bit more about the brewery and, and, and Simon, you mentioned how you guys started out and, you know, sort of eventuated from the, the Hearts Pub venture. Um, when you plan to do the the actual concept of the brewery, what what was the main goal in terms of the model? Was it a brew pub, production, or what, what, what was, uh, what was it? I think I think our the biggest thing that we wanted to do was conquer the world. Uh, we wanted to go forth and you know be the best. Um, we were looking up to our big brother down the road, Young Henry's, which is where Raddy went. We were looking at Manly Four Pines with great jealousy. We were looking at uh, some of the bigger guys into the state as well, thinking that's where we could be. Mm. 
Mm. Um, so we built the brew pub. Um, when we were looking around this area, we were we wanted to be in Alexandria. We wanted to be outside of this, just outside of the city, um, because most of our business was done in the city with with some of the bars and uh, pubs in there. And we wanted a production facility big enough that we knew that we could make a million plus letters a year. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is what we built. Um, it's uh, it took and we found this place. And it literally landed in our lap, and that courtyard out there is the best thing we, you know, we could ever get. Mm. Um, and right now, we're in the middle of the biggest growth area in Sydney. So that's pretty cool um, for us in the future. Uh, but we still got to make sure that we keep all the silverware out there going, and the bar and the, and the restaurant down there mm. absolutely on its going all the time. Yeah, yeah, and and. What did you start out system wise, brew house? What, what sort of size were you, were you brewing? Well, down. Well, not now, but initially. So we never had a brew house. We were with, uh, so we were with, uh, with, originally they were brewing with um, uh, Young Henry's. Uh, they were brewing with um, uh, IBC down in uh, Illawarra. And yeah, Illawarra Brewing. Uh, Five um, Islands down, down there as well. Australia, the Australian. And the Australian was doing some stuff. Australian, Australian were doing cider work all the way right to 2013. Uh, yeah. So yeah, we've been around. So we were we were good little gypsy girls, and we worked out early. And and I should say they worked out it early. The the previous um, um, shareholders and, and, and owners um, how to sell beer and make some good money out of it about um, purchasing it at a wholesale. With a wholesaler's license, mm. so yeah, they did a good job, and they got us. And you know, we used to be in about fifty plus bars and clubs around. So, mm. talking about the Gypsy Brewing concept, um, I was talking to Pete uh, from Waywood last week, and we, we touched on the topic. Uh, you know, we mentioned that it was a it's a good concept to sort of dip your toes into the market if you don't really have the capital behind you. You're looking at trying to build a bit of brand awareness in the market, um, but essentially it's not a, a viable model uh, or business model is what Pete sort of gave out the impression. The, yeah, and I think that's because you get yourself to a level where you know, look, we need to have our own brewery. And so you could start off with the small kids and stuff like that. Mm. But, I, th- you know, I think, you know, something that does a 1,000 litres is probably – going to be good 500 litres I suppose would do it wouldn't it Ed? yeah look I think you work at 24-7 or something like that uh, yeah. it all depends on volume as well like you got to look at some of the other gypsy brewers out there the guys who are getting a bit of awareness and some might go down the route where they get a bigger brewery where it's dedicated to just doing the production of their stuff and some might just deal with a brew pub where they then can sit and sell their specialties and that way they've they got a good money earner. They've already got the names that people know and they still get their main, like their biggest sort of package stock items made off site still. Um, and I guess brew pubs have been the one that have in everyone's mouth at the moment because it is a lot more of a viable business model compared to a big production brewery because production breweries solely rely on volume and if you don't have those relationship ties or even the sales already before you start building that place, then you're not going to succeed and you're not going to be around for a long time. And it costs a lot of money to run a production brewery. Uh, it costs a, lot, a bit of money to run a, a brew pub, but a lot less. Um, and again, you've already got a confirmed source for selling all your keg stock and you're selling at a cost price, which is the, the big thing for gypsy brewers is that their cost price is actually quite expensive compared to somebody like who owns a brewery. Well, you're essentially paying for someone else's stainless, really, aren't you? Yeah, or yeah. well, everything. You do, it's not just you, you know you be you're putting in ingredients. Um, you're paying for the labor, the, the time and tank. You're paying for the logistics side of the movement of the beer. Sometimes people need it stored. Sometimes they need it delivered. Like all of these are variables that just add up and add up, um, you know, and it's great when you're getting your name out there, but, you know, you do see Gypsy Brewers are quite quite tight and they have to be just to keep their, their heads above it. And then eventually they get a name, they get investors, brew pub or production brewery, and it's sort yeah. of, yeah. yeah. But it's not, 
it's not an easy thing. And, and what are some of the standard contracting agreements that, uh, you know, for example, I've dialed in a few recipes at, in the backyard. I'd like to then take it to someone like Rocks. Mm, okay. um, yep, yeah, brew it on a commercial level. So, what what are what are some of the, the we, standard? We agreements? used to start. We used to <coughs> throw down a contract in front of a new guy and confuse the hell out of them as soon as they walked in the door. So what we do now is that we we, we literally we end up with a with a with a purchase order and a, and a quote. We give them a, a, a sheet of terms and conditions with regards to um, credit application, um, and then we look at their recipe and we give them a price. And once we give them a price, we get a, we get an order from the customer, within, and so we ask for you to pay within seven days. Um, with some of our customers, we'll ask for a quarter up front, um, just depending on um, who that customer is. Um, and the reason why we do that is because we put a lot of money into to the, um, uh, the the purchasing of the raw material for the for the goods. Mm. Um, uh, we put a little a small margin on it. There's not a massive margin on it. To us, it's all about uh, volume here um, and trying to keep that volume up. Um, so, do you guys charge? Uh, on volume, the per, per batch, or is it a, a per so we, we, type arrangement? No, 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 it's per batch. Ah, uh, sorry, no, it's not. It's per, um, we, we charge on a per keg and a per case. Right, okay. Um, and what we do is that we do minimum batches. So a minimum batch here is a 4,000 litre batch. Um, 2,000 litres is just not economical for us. Um, and our largest batch, of course, is 6,000. But guys, guys will try and order 100 hectolitres. Or uh, sorry, 10,000 litres, um, and we can spread that over to fermentation units. Mm. Um, right now, um, for us to take a new customer on, they won't be brewing with us until March. Why right, so that busy? Uh, oh, we're, yeah, we're, we're doing quite well. Mm. And and it's it's about um, our reputation in the market. These, um, this brewer here in front of sitting next to us is um, pretty good at what he does. Don't want to waste him up too much. Does he normally blush like that? No, yeah. he's uh, pretty good. And um, uh, as I said before, we've got a good operation, uh, opera, uh, operations manager as well, and it, it works it, because you've really got to think about, as I said before, you've got to keep everything moving and keep your costs down, um, keep your costs down with your, your supplies as well, like your grain and, and your hops. Um, because those relationships can sour easily if you're not paying your bills and you've and you got to pay your bills as well. Mm. So. And, and that, that was another point um, just going on the, the contracting side. There's there's a bit of flexibility that Gypsy Brewer does have with whether you supply the, the ingredients on their behalf or whether they source it themselves. Do you have a bit of flexibility? Well, I, I would imagine that, look, I'd, I'm happy uh, when, a, when a guy comes to me and says, oh, look, here's the grain. Um, you know, I've, I've sourced this grain. Well, we're happy to use it, um, and we'll take that price off because um, we don't place any margin on raw material. Um, what I would suggest, though, is that you use us as the buying power because it's our buying power that that'll get. You know, I mean, there are guys in the market other than us that are bigger contract brewers than us as well who have much stronger buying power than us and, and some of their rates are, are pretty amazing. So when you get to that volume, you're more than welcome to go there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, um, one of the conversations that we've been having this morning as we re-release our brand into the market, um, the Rocks brand or the Rocks Brewing Co brand, um, we've been talking about production and how much are we going to have for Christmas and whether or not we're going to run out of hangman for Christmas and unfortunately some some things suffer mm. so we could knock a couple of things on the head mm. and Adric's not going to be happy with me later but that's what it is <laughs> right. probably guess already haven't you special news yeah. <laughs> well, sorry buddy yeah. we've already we've already looked at some things but yeah. we, we, we've had a but we have a specialty program or we just we just came up with one and I think it's great ideas and I really 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 want to do them but unfortunately you've got other things that prioritise and that's your own brand and making sure that you don't run out in the market 
and then you've got your customers and you've got to make sure that they're being looked after as well, otherwise they're not going to stay with you. And, you know, we have... Let's say we have two really good main customers now that I can't mention. Yep. As I said, we're under a non-disclosed agreement with everyone that we do business with. Um, And, you know, we've got... 10 other customers that we, we work with as well, mm. um, including some of our, our wash customers as well. So we make alcoholic wash here for distillers. And um, and uh, that's um, turned quite, quite just keeps the sausage machine running down there, as I said mm. before, right? I think as well, like, I, I mean, guys who are looking at wanting to do gypsy brewing, you've got to remember that the recipe that you've done of beer smith on your little brew father in the garden will look nothing like what you'll give I'll give you back because the biggest the biggest difference is is professional brewings in you know on a different realm and when you're doing it in these volumes like things don't add up and it's also the equipment as well We've got a lot more efficient equipment um, so a lot of the numbers like what we a lot of our contract uh, brewers they'll come in and give me a recipe and I'm like well I need to rejig this. Are you happy with that? And, you know, all the time, if I, yeah, that's fine. You sort of know what's going on. And then it's, again, our job just to pull that apart and look at what their their idea of their beer was and then to match that. Um, because as, on a recipe base, it might have some similarities, but a lot of the time it looks very different. Mm-hmm. And that has always been yeah, something that I've sort of pondered as, how you scale up from homebrew to pro brewing, and, and and how vastly different that beer would taste, and yeah. um, so you guys would be able to work with that homebrewer wanting to become gypsy, mm. um, of trying to get them to those flavor profiles and those certain. Yeah, there's a couple of guys recently um, that we're doing that for. I think the biggest thing that um, homebrewers need to understand is a. Uh, Instead of banging on about all the, the different types of ingredients and all this sort of stuff, you just need to know your parameters. You need to know what your target IBU is, what your sort of target color and haze and ABV is, and then what sort of flavors you're trying to get. Um, and then that, then we can then go and build something, and then you can then start suggesting some ingredients. And it's sort of that real basic breakdown that. I guess maybe these are numbers that, you know, as homebrewers, they tend not to look too much into, but they're actually probably one of the most important pieces of information for us as a, a contract uh, brewery. And we'll do the recipe development as well. Yeah, yeah. So we're happy to do that. It, 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 it works because then, in my mind, the, the, the customer is always much happier with the end. Oh, yeah, yeah. We get like, so we've got customers who, um, I guess, they might have beers for their different um, businesses um, and they know a product that they want because they know they know the beers that they like but they don't know anything about brewing so they'll come to me and then ask me to brew something that tastes similar between these types of beers in this style range and then off I work with them design a recipe and then produce it for them so far everyone's been pretty happy with what we've been putting out to them uh, and, and what would be if you were to rattle off a few points or maybe a checklist what what should a gypsy brewer have organized before they come in and, and start talking about you know hey i want you to brew my beer commercially money definitely <laughs> yeah. um yeah don't don't have this um green-eyed view of what the craft beer industry is like because it's very very hard slog um you've got to be putting in a lot of hours even as professionals and guys who are quite established like ourselves you know 10 11 12 hour days are alien to us we do them a lot um and also i guess understanding the parameters of your different brews so understanding what your sort of targets are what your ibu is what your abv is um where you want to be with it and understand the market um there's a billion xpas out there you know there's a billion lagers out there you need to, if you're a gypsy brewer, you need a peacock. I mean, people want to notice you because in that fridge, in Dan Murphy's or wherever you're going to sell it, you know, you're just going to be another pale ale amongst another 50,000. And for us, producing a pale ale in a can isn't as expensive as it is for those guys. And we don't have that risk because we can always sell it through our bar or our website. 
So we, we had some guys come in this week and I was a bit negative around what they wanted to do because they wanted to do another lager in the market and it's a specialty lager and it needs to be lagered. What? Well, we lager our lagers as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But this that, one, that holds up tanks, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. Five to seven weeks. So, so it has to be big volume. So, to, uh, yeah, it has to be big volume, but it's going to add a lot of cost to their, to, yeah. their, to their brew because they're basically renting the space. Mm. And at the same time, they've got to think about it at the end, how much that's going to cost them to put it in the market. Mm. So, I mean, we work on um, some, um, you know, what we like to go to the market with with regards margin and, and you know, just like in a, m- most bars, I want a 70% GP downstairs. So you got to make sure that you'd be able to get it into the bar or the club or the pub and that they can put on a, a, a good margin, you know, without it costing, you know, $19 a pint. Mm. You know, you want it, you know... So we, we, we set a standard downstairs about what we think that should be in per pint. And so we suggest to the hotels and, and the pubs and clubs, this is what we sell it at. You guys are welcome to sell it at whatever price you want. Mm. Um, and, you know, the same goes with Dan Murphy's and, and Coles and all those guys. you just got to have expectation about what you want to put in the market at what price because... Um, if you make those mistakes in the beginning, you can never go back. Mm. You can never go back. It's understanding your market. Understand that I mean, if you drive up your costs on a lager like that, and not to say that you should you should always be lagering lagers, but build into a price that you, you know no one's going to be on that go into a a bottle shop and be like, oh, a four and a half percent lager, I'll pay thirty bucks for a six pack. No, they won't. Not when there's a six and a half percent IPA from another brewery sat right next to it they're going to go for that um, you know for us lagering lagers as our MO but they're our tanks it doesn't cost us that much money to lager our beers you know do you think that uh, the lagers are, are now just simply reserved for the big boys um, no I don't think so I just think you've got to really and again with all lagers as well I think you just would really put a lot of thought into it I think I think it's going to be part of your repertoire right yeah, look, I think if you're going into market, the two 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 products you want, Palau and an IPA to lead with, yeah. then your lager. Um, and that's our second lager. So. Yeah, that's our second. Our first was a Mars. It's very nice, actually. Pilsner. 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 Yeah. yeah, so a continental Pilsner, I guess you call it. I guess it's more, definitely more of a sort of German Czech style, very, very light. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, and then our other, our other lagers are Mars and like an Oktoberfest style. Um, but again, like lagers need that thought, and I think a lot of people just don't put thought into it. Even a lot of homebrewers or um, companies out in the market just they treat it like all the big boys have treated it for all along. It's just this little PC product that doesn't really need much thought to it, but they do. The lagers are very hard to brew because they're delicate and they need a lot of thought if you're going to enter one into a market. Yeah, there's not much hot. Uh well, you can't really hide behind it. No, it feels nice. You know, you know, pale ale, easy. You just throw the hops at it and you can hide all, your, all the other mistakes that you've made in there, you know. Well, I guess uh, getting off the, the gypsy brewing, and I really sure. appreciate that. Um, I know that uh, um, it's definitely something our listeners will be interested to, to hear about starting out. But for those looking at investing in stainless, lessons learned. What would you say were the biggest challenges you faced opening the brewery? So we're now open seven years. We're going through a program of replacing pig steel or pig iron with uh, stainless steel. Yeah, so our steam lines, our steam lines weren't stainless, and um, in, which they should have been in the first place. And now they're all for their, they're blowing out actually, which is quite dangerous. So we're you know, going through the expensive procedure of replacing them all with stainless. So. But it, that's been a good understanding for, for, for both Eddie and I because we know more about our equipment now. Mm. Um, it's been a, it's a long it's a long project. It can't just be done overnight because you can't stop the production. So we we look for a day where we know that we're going to stop and we get them in and they did do it and it could go over into the next day and that holds everything up. So, and we've had a couple of those in the last couple of months, right? Mm, preventative maintenance Pre- is key. Yeah, right? key. If you don't, if you don't do it, 
and it might not seem like nothing's happening and it's all rosy for another couple of years until you start getting busy and then everything starts falling apart. There's no engineers around. The parts cost you an arm and a leg. The guys who made your pump four years ago don't exist. All of these little things. There are, uh, there are guys out there that will help you build a brewery. Guys like um, Neil Cameron. Um, His names, I think, come up. Every single episode now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Good old Neil. I think Neil, Neil's uh, looking at getting involved actually, so I'll be meeting with yeah. him in a couple of weeks' time. Hopefully. Scotty Morgan is a uh, guy that works here as well. He he put this brewery together. I reckon he did a good job with yeah. with what we did. I mean, this brewery cost us um, just over a million bucks in cash, um, and basically we leased all of the equipment. So whatever dollar we got back from the leases we put more equipment we put more equipment we put more equipment and what we didn't do is we didn't fill all of that equipment um, we're also starting to learn now that we overspec and overspecking is not the greatest thing to do in here because overspecking so buying equipment that's too big to do its job so therefore you're using equipment it's switched on 24-7 and it runs itself out because it's not working properly. Hmm. See, and you don't hear that story a lot with a lot of the smaller breweries because it's always your the one at something flip. They, yeah, want, they want something bigger. It started too just, small. And, so you guys probably we, went too big. Oh, too well, big, okay. yeah. So there was a big, I guess the thing is like um, – the, you know, the previous guys always had this this vision in their head of what this brew was going to be, and it was big, 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 and they had ants in their pants, um, you know, and uh, I guess we got the biggest and some of the best equipment out there at the time, um, and it's still great. It's probably one of the best systems I've worked on, brewery And, and what, what is the system that you guys work on? Uh, it's a HEB, so a high efficiency uh, brew system. So it's a mash mash press f- filter system from um, IDD in the US. IDD, yep. Yeah. Um, so it's us and Young Henry's have one. Henry's bought one after us, after seeding ours. Uh, you know, everything's steam controlled. So everything is, um, we do everything step mash here. Uh, so we have a lot more control over our beer. Um, the brew system is automated, um, it's semi automated, I guess. So you type in, you know, your mashing profiles and everything like that and then off it goes um, which gives the brewer a bit of time to prep for the next beer so on a general day one brewer can do three brews in a normal workout and that's from starting at 7 and finishing at 3.30 and at 3.30 everything's cleaned down prep for the next day wow um, yeah and they're 2,000 litre batches at a time so you can have every vessel filled we could do we could do more you could do more if we had a bit more to spread the shifts out a bit more um, and yeah, I, I know YH you, do that YH are pushing up they, they're getting up to like eight brews a day and when I increase the size of our fermentation units yeah, yeah, I guess it'd be going that down that direction. But you know, the lesson that we learned was that let's just keep running at high capacity for a lot a while until we really desperate and you know because We're trying to put some money in the bank, right? Yeah, that's it. And this industry fluctuates so much, you know. But it, so but it doesn't it doesn't sound like a. It sounds like a, a luxury though that that you can grow into that system. We so. we I've got a wish list. It's as long as my arm. So, you know, the, there's a nutcracker down there. Yeah, we, go, we, yeah. we, we want um, the, uh, the oh, what do you call that thing where you put a grain in, mate? Um, oh, so a new uh, mill. A new yeah, mill. For this no, no, but we want the, uh, the oh, the. Oh, he wants a so grain silo. So I want a grain silo. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Um, well, yeah, word silo there. Yeah, there's just I would love lagering tanks. There's you know there's there's always a the pasteurizer. Yeah. So we can export. So we, that that's a really big fit in our gap. Well, yeah. that that helps shelf life and what's uh, the thing you yeah. have level the. Um, Centrifuge. Centrifuge. Uh, yeah, and look, you know, a decent pilot kit. I mean, we're running on a little a 200 litre pot system um, for the boys down there. But the problem, the biggest issue for us is that, you know, we'll do our pilot brews, sell them on the bar, but I want those pilot brews to be at the quality we get out of the heads. Yeah. And for that, we, we need something that's a bit decent. And again, yeah. they're and not prop- cheap. Propagation tanks. Yeah, well, we've got small prop tanks at the moment that we're running. We need bigger ones because we're now sort of brewing a lot out of them, which is great. Um, which is great. Money's out. 
More racking arms. Yeah, racking arms. That was a wasn't a thought at that point when they built this brewery and we're now spending seven years without racking arms. Yeah, we figured out how much we've lost and it was you know, when I started I was like, it's not happening. I got somebody to design and build them for us and we're now gaining an extra like nine nine kegs a batch you know, out of it. Nine saleable kegs a batch. Yeah. So it's yeah. I mean yeah. It's been a few, yeah, there's a few learnings. There's a few, few more to go. Yeah, 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 definitely. But our investments last year made it good. So, yeah, it's a cool room, 1,500 kegs, and the wild goose behind uh, filling machine. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, now we're not only doing, we can do our own package and even very small limited releases, but it's the gypsy brewers because of the markets change completely now. And everything is in package, we can sell that. You know, there's a certain plus we're a bonded warehouse. Yeah. They can so, store here. And, and what are you doing? How would you ratio percentage wise, would you say packaging versus kegs? Right now it's 25, 75 to kegs. But I would say that we'll swap that in the future. That'll that'll we'll be selling more cases in the future. Hmm. As we go. So we sell more cases now for some of our other customers, but even even our largest customers still kegs mm. um, because there are other places that will do mass runs of canning um, for a hell of a lot cheaper than us because they can get the material a lot cheaper. But as we grow, yeah. we should get there. Okay. So if you were to start all over again, and this might tie into, I guess, the biggest challenges that you had, with what you know now, what would you do differently starting over again? I would, um, for the system that we have, I would change my fermentation units to uh, skinnier and taller to start off with. I would put in a walkway gantry above the, the, um, uh, the tanks. I would ensure from the very first day that we had a cool room large enough to store the beer that we, we make. Um, Not as many tanks at, the, at, at once. Yeah. You know? Um, I, I would try and do f- four sets of three fermentation rather than three sets of three. Mm. I think that would make a big difference. And I'd have bigger brights so that I can muck around with those because there's more work in this brewery than just making beer. So we know that we can mix and we know that we can make alcoholic wash. Um, yeah, what else, what would you do? Lager tanks. Oh, pro- proper lager tanks. The yeah. ones that lay on the sides. Yeah, yeah. The horizontal right, yeah. ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But you, um, put those, you, you can put those up high and put them off an island. Oh, you can stack them. You can stack them and all that. But yeah, no, look, I think for That'd me, I'm cool. a bit of a traditionalist when it comes to making That'd be cool. You can put them off the island, I reckon. Yeah. <laughs> be hard to clean them. You're going to be getting up there, clusticking from where. Oh, that's what we do. We put a lab in. Yeah, yeah, a lab, lab. definitely. Yeah. Um, and not Probably the first thing we needed. That, yeah, actually. yeah. And look, that's we, something that uh, Steve Henderson from Rockstar Brewer bangs on about a lot. Yeah. Making sure so, you have a lab. It doesn't have to be this fancy fifty thousand, hundred thousand dollar lab. It you know you can do some cost effective. He know is a great friend of our brewery, and uh, that's one of the things that he's asked us to do. Mm. In fact, when I first met Hendo. Um, we returned to the brewery two years ago. He said, "Simon, you've got to get yourself a DO meter. We've got that DO meter now, and it oh, it's wow. changed our world." Yeah, so DO meter is really important. Yeah, DO DO meter and a good CO two meter. Um, yeah. Don't be guessing you can that get a, you can get a combined one now, can't you? Yeah, you can get a DO CO two. But remember, like the combined unit, um, you want the decent one. That's twenty grand. Yeah. Um, well, the DO by itself was seven eight. Yeah, yeah. So the combines about twenty five, about twenty five, I'd say. But you know, again, like with the lab, you want you could go down the microscope route and everything, or you could just go buy an Oculize, which we've done. The Oculize has saved us a lot of time, and again, it's not just a time thing, but it's the accuracy, of the, the 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 software itself that you sort of you know exactly how much you need to pitch. A lot of the time you're actually over pitching, so you can probably go under a bit on that. Um, I would build the brewery too with propagation. 
now, but we know. Well, yeah, propagation. We never, we never did that in the beginning. Yeah. Um, definitely. It's got to leave a bit of space for other things as well. Centrifuge. Filtering. Make sure that you've got filtering. Oh, that's what you do. You put in that um, water system. And that, um, yeah, good water filtration as well. Yeah. I'd probably go um, RO. The, the, the light, a special light. Oh, yeah, having a sterile um, water tank would be good as well for dilution. Um, definitely. I mean, if there's something for, I guess, our size and what we're doing as well, if you're building more into the future. Um, but, like, the basics in the lab is definitely a must. So, so an RO system, because uh, you see that in a lot of breweries now, and um, it basically gives you a, a nice, clean blanket or, or slate for, to work from mm-hmm. in the water process. Yeah, completely blanket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Nothing. yeah. Yeah, and uh, does it, I guess investing in a good RO system because some of them, especially for a unit your size or brew house, they, they take quite a long time to fill. Yeah, so we, we didn't. So we started this brewery with a filtration system at the side, and we didn't use it. Yeah, no one was using it when I started it. When I started back here, I was like, "Oh, that's ridiculous!" So we are back and we've turned that on, which is great. But it didn't cost us anything to turn it on. No, no look. Yes, decent RO system for sure. Um, you need to understand water chemistry before you go and start building a brewery. Um, or even like if you're starting as a gypsy brewer, start learning your water chemistry because changes when, when you get to this size, it's everything because it's all the little minute things and you've got to win awards to start people to get noticing. Don't cheap out on your glycol. Yeah. Biggest, biggest thing. Get a system that is big enough and something that you could probably grow into. Glycol is probably the only thing you should buy that you want to grow into because... Even we're having problems here, though. Yeah, because right? once the demand gets in it, the age in that system goes, you adds, it you would give you multiple problems and it's the most most important part of the brewery. So it's something you see out too, though, right? Because yeah. we're struggling with that now properly. And- yeah, look, I guess good CO2 management is a good thing. Uh, I mean, if you're in the city, it's very it's very good. But if you're out in the sticks, like uh, Wicked Elf and um, I know uh, More Beer and like a lot of those guys that are further up the coast, they don't, they don't have the services we do here. It takes them a little while to get ingredients and it does us. Um, they can't, they don't have, BOC don't have a huge center there so they can't go and fill up huge tanks of CO2. So they buy small bottles and daisy chain and go off that. And that's, oh, it's almost homebrew scale. Oh, it's it? labor intensive. Um, and you just, you know, you're purging tanks and going through multiple bottles, which petrified tiles on the floor, brewer's tiles. Yeah, this is something that uh, I, I thought we would eventually talk about in some of the episodes, but it seems to be an overlooked thing is is the floor design, uh, slot drains. Yeah, drainage. We've yep. we got an epoxy floor with a slot drain, which is the slot drain's fine. But that, yeah. The pit needs to be bigger, the right? Pit, oh, no, the pit, struggling to find somebody who will empty a pit is a hard one. Yeah. Um, but... Definitely a decent pit for when we say pit, effluent pit for your waste. Um, but yeah, epoxy, throw that down the drain. The, petrified, the petrified tiles, mm. so they're harder than concrete. So they're, ba- they're basically like um, petrified wood that turns into stone. It's really, really hard material. It's, a, it's called a brewer's tile. I mean, yeah, I, they're not cheap though. Uh, no, when I was in the US, when I was last in the US, we went to, uh, was it? It was um, Allagash, mm. Allagash Brewery. And this guy had spent, like, he had spent millions on this joint. And basically the fermentation units, the bottom of the fermentation unit was on, on one level. And then above that was another floor, like, well, for walking around. And all the tiles, floors and walls and ceiling we're all, we're all t- just everywhere, right? Yeah. And you just go around with a hot water hose and the whole place was just absolutely... Made it so much easier. Oh, look, you've you got to you gotta remember um, also having like entrance and ent- like doorways to, to be able to easily close and open like quickly because you don't want airflow from the outside in the brewery um, because you're just dragging in whatever else is floating out there, which is usually wild yeast and lacto. Um, and if you if you find if you've got nooks and crannies in your brewery, bits are lifting under the floor, shit's gonna grow under there no matter how much chemicals you spray around there. And that's 
it's infection risk is the the biggest things that we concentrate in a brewery is fermentation management and an infection control is cleaning like 80 percent of a brewer's job is cleaning because we've just got to make sure that this product is stable in the market especially when we're going into cans a lot these days mm-hmm. um so you know, p- people only want a sour beer when you say it's sour. <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, I never thought I'd like sours, that's for sure. Yeah. Mm. Um, no, I'm also a big fan of them. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and then there's some great gems to take away from that. You, you focus a lot on the equipment side, which is probably a little different to what the last couple episodes. So it's, it's good to sort of hear about the mistakes or, or the do differently um, of, of when sourcing that equipment and, and when planning the, the brewery as well, which seems to be very important. But You could spend $10 million downstairs or you could spend half a million. Mm. I, I suppose, I don't know, I've never bought the Chinese equipment. Yeah, look, the Chinese equipment's good. Um, a lot of people I know that have really good runs with, I'm pretty sure Black Ops is all Chinese as well. Yeah, I, I hear Tai and Tai come up a lot. Um, so, and I'm hoping to have a couple dedicated episodes for equipment, um, yeah. where you know, how to source it, what you should be considering. But um, so the IDD that you guys have—that's yes. an American system, which you would expect to be sure. probably the Rolls Royce type. And the wild goose is uh, from Colorado. From what wild goose memes in Colorado, yeah. right? and the well, scarf. They're, they're that's good. American Colorado. systems are good, but remember, they're all American parts. They're all American sizes. Imperial, and so it's all imperial. So you've got to you've got to fight with that. You've also got to fight with the fact that the voltages and everything are different over there. So, so you try, yeah, that's the thing. When you get a piece of equipment and it comes to you after you've told them the spec is two forty volt. And <laughs> it comes over 110. Yeah. And you have to have the, um, an electrician come in and change it. Yeah. So there are additional costs. So, you know, up to... Oh, freight as well. Freight's ridiculous. And it could be... Somebody would be like, oh, it's going to be here in a couple of months. And then one year later, you get it. And you, you've got to really be prepared for that. You know? that that's, so we had... Uh, the, the candy machine was paid for in September and didn't arrive until April. Mm. Pay for it in full. Mm. So, because they want money up front, mm. and we were worried that it wasn't coming. And we got parts and things and everything. We still had to change things. Still, the sparkies coming. You still needed sparkies coming and put all the, the electricity in for running the system. You need to make sure it fits where you got to go and it's doing the right it's thing. Crazy, crazy stuff. And you got a learning curve on all of this. Like, we had a massive learning curve on the, the canning line. And yeah, I think you just got to run. Put your expectations a little bit lower. And two, plan a brewery that's accessible for the brewers. Yeah. Easy to dry hop, easy to clean, um, easy to run, you know. Um, don't just go cheap because you'll be paying for it. In the yeah, future. and then don't overthink. Don't, like, not think about your drainage. Not think about how they're going to access the tanks, you know. Don't put a tank where you can't lift the lid open because I've seen that before as well. It's... People just don't think where they're going to put these things because they don't think like brewers, you know. Sometimes it's good to have a big lid too, so you can climb in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true. Um, <laughs> when did you? What did you do the other day? You dropped the spray ball. Out. Oh no, the spray ball had uh, gone into the the kettle. That was in the so, kettle. Yeah, one of the boys had to go in and get that. Yeah, oh. it's, yeah, yeah, and it's not. But he's got a what? He's got a special house. Yeah, he's got a confined space. Space. You need confined space. You need confined space to go and do those things. Get a forklift license. You're going to probably need that. Um, if you're doing a brew pub, you could probably get away with not having a forklift license. Um, but Just a normal pallet jack sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, but you I, still, again, your brew pub's a small size. You're going to so. need a lifter of some description yeah. because I saw even B yesterday jammed his finger in the um, in, in the kegs. To cry, but he did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's it. Like you've got to definitely, you've got to. Just, you know, if you speak to a brewer, go in, and if you've got once you've got your plans all together and everything that you think is fine, go see a couple of professionals and show them. Yeah, we're not. We don't want to hear about your dreams and aspirations. But if you come here with a big plan and go, look, this is what I'm thinking. Can you lay your eyes? Most brewers would be like happy to do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right, there's there's two guys here. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. No, yeah. You, you guys yeah. have rattled off. Oh, I'd, I'd have to go over the recording again and just write all this shit down. But uh, you <laughs> yeah. rattled off a lot. But I uh, really appreciate it. And uh, I guess just to take a couple minutes now, just getting your takes on the the future of the industry, um, not just here in Sydney, but Australia wide. Um, beer trends, uh, where you see you know breweries should sort of look at for where the next big big thing is in beer. While we remain independent and we have a great um, uh, independent brewers association and the guys like Pete and, um, and the others before him um, and the guys that are doing it now, like our mate Rich uh, as well, um, we are going to get stronger and stronger. Um, we need some help from the government right now because we we're going to talk about COVID as well. Mm-hmm. Um, we need help around excise and dealing with the, the, the multinationals um, that are in this country um, because they've got contracts and it's clearly unfair business. Mm. Clearly unfair business where they keep us out of hotels. And that's what Pete mentioned, anti, very anti-competitive type. Oh, it's, anti, it's very it's anti-competitive. Normal. But we will get stronger um, as we get more from the government as they see um, our use. Um, I budget that they released the other night will be good for this brewery um, in effect for equipment and staffing mm. so we'll, we'll we'll take that up and run but I see a good future for us yeah. I see a good future for this brewery particularly um, do you see is it still in the early days for new entrants um, look I think we're sort of in, almost in our middle area like where um, the, you know it was we're still not, not in that stage where America is, but America is always the best one to follow because they're the young, they're the oldest craft beer scene. I'm not talking about the Europeans or anything, but as a craft beer scene, they're probably the one yeah, that sort of set, set yeah. the trend. We've still, um, we've still got a lot of people out there who don't like the fruity beers and all of this sort of. You know, yeah, but they might. But that's, they might not. Going less, less. Well, they don't taste it because they don't, they don't want to. Yeah, look, I think that's you, you've got. One, you've got your general public. I think um, a big thing is education in the in the industry here, which um, uh, that's uh, Richard from YH Rich, and yeah. um, Neil Cameron uh, hitting up with TAFE, which they've been doing a really good job at getting entry level people in and training them up because that wasn't that was non-existent I when I started. A, I want a premises on, on uh, job seeking right now. Yeah, that would be great. Um, I think. Uh, as beer trends go, the industry is going to be – it's going to be a funny one. Yes, for the, the beer nerds and the established guys who are in the in the, the beer industry, I spoke to one of the uh, brewers at Firestone Walker a couple of years ago and I was like, what's the, what's the trend in the market in America at the moment? And he's like, well, this is going to be for the world. And I was like, what? And people want beer that tastes like juice. And that's what's going to be the big thing. And we saw it. Fruited sours, fruited gozes, uh, neepers. And, like, it's, it's going down that, like, I mean, I'm a West Coast boy f- f- day in, but and I don't mind making the neepers or drinking a couple, but it's it's heavy on that. And I don't think that trend's going to die very soon. But I also think lagers are going to be the next because it's what's happening in America is the crappy industry has its neeper arm, but its lager arm is going berserk because people – realizing that actually I know the big boys make lager that tastes like us but lager can be a nice beer and it has been for centuries so I think it's that's where the industry is going to be it's just going to be beer that tastes like juice beer that tastes like it's a lager you're going to see a new <laughs> new different kind of lager that's going to spring up oh 100 percent. i don't think it's going to you know some might cross over into the ipa realm which they already have um but i really think we're going to go it, there's going to be a reinsurgence a bigger insurgence of uh traditional brewing which we have seen with like the rise of the goza which is a thousand year old style of beer um and berliner weiss as well um, and then you've got, um, you know, your farmhouse ales and raw ales that are all people are all starting to do, you know, and people are paying $80 a bottle for, you know, your wildflower. They've got, they've got all these doing, doing is blending, brewing and blending and 
harvesting yeast of the flowers that they're putting into the fruit and that's where you're going to see that sort of artisan culture really take off is mm. people are going to be looking to the past mm. um, which I think is great to be honest mm. yeah. sort of yeah just need that proper test kit <laughs> here's the other thing <laughs> more money thanks more money <laughs> and uh, just going or touching on COVID again um, so how has how have you guys sort of adapted to so, that we were flying in February. First two weeks of March, we had really pumping weeks. We ended on the 14th of March with a Gypsy Brewers Festival downstairs. It was a really good day, wasn't it, Ed? Mm, yeah. Um, and uh, <clears throat> that next week, the landlord was telling people not to come in. So they were literally telling people not to come to work telling people to stay away. We stayed open right throughout from from March and through until today, of course. Um, Redu- reduced our staff down. It was only did, me in there. Yeah, we lost 20, <laughs> we lost 20 people, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, we're back up to 20 now. So we were at around 37. Um, we've been on JobKeeper. We did takeaways while we were open. We made more IPA than we've ever made before in our lives. <laughs> Um, and we sold them in growlers and we sold them in um, cans because we've got a, a, a Dixie canner on our bar downstairs. Um, and so we, we struggled in March and April and May and then we started to look good in June all of a sudden. And then July we put some money on the bottom line and in August we surprised everyone. And then in September we've had another good month again and so October will be great. We won't be into JobKeeper. I mean, you know, that's probably talking out of turn, but we'll lose our JobKeeper in um, November um, because our last quarter was just 12% down on the year before, which is not a bad result, I think, after going through what we've gone. The place that we suck all of our customers from is 40% full for Monday through Friday but we attract people here on Fridays and Saturdays and Sundays and it's doing good it's going alright I think package is going to be the key um, through this pandemic and probably after that it's establishing itself quite well and um, again like you know with Sam was touching on um, you know that contra- uh, a lot of bars are contracted to the big boys um, the one thing that bottle shops aren't is contracted and the one thing that bottle shops do want is variety. And um, again, like that means that our weird and wonderful beers and those little farmhouses and 8% neighbors and stuff can actually be sold because it's not bars for a bar. It's a big risk to take a keg that expensive and try and sell it in a pint. But if you could average consumer when they're sitting at home on their bum and they don't really have to deal with bounces or anything. You know, tuck into a six yeah, pack of eight percent beers and <laughs> fall, probably fall asleep on the couch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Asleep yeah. Watching that you know, for us, it's that's fine. It's not hurting anyone, and um, people are getting out and you know, let's get those weird and wonderful beers into their hands, which we love. You know, keeps my my team and me I, sane as well. Our priorities turn to the brewery rather than being on the retail operation here. So, but I think that's that's natural course. That that our brewery is very very capable. And uh, the, the, the tap house that we love to call it downstairs is uh, it's also very capable. And I, I think it's going to spring back. I mm. think it, as soon as blood gets it right, we'll be fine. Mm. We'll be fine. Yeah. There's no COVID. Apart from three cases. Wow. Well, <laughs> yeah, actually, I think Penrith actually copped a big recently. Yeah. yeah. Can I put Penrith? Yeah. They said it was in the sewer. They were right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They're yeah. testing. Mm. Well, uh, thanks again, guys, for sharing us a, a good hour. You've been very kind with your time and a lot of lot of great information for our listeners to take away, including myself. But uh, any closing thoughts or advice that you want to share? Uh, no, anything Don't that you, uh, I think you guys just. I think everyone just needs to realise it's not a party every day. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you can have lots of fun along the way, but there's uh, it's really really hard work. Yeah, there's yeah. going to be moments where I think you're going to be like, "Oh my god, this is all of my dreams come true." You know, people are praising you for your beer, and you're at a festival drinking as much free beer as you can get hold of. And then moments where 
things are breaking down around you. You're on a 14 hour day. This nothing's going right. Um, and you know, and you get hassled by your boss. You get ha- yeah, yeah, is it, all of those things. And so you got to, and there's going to be a lot more of that than there is the good. But uh, you relish the good, and that outweighs that sort of that yeah. stress. And like craft, the independent craft industry, we all look after each other. And if anyone needs advice, approach one of the breweries. Like I'm. We'll be happy to give anyone advice, really. Yeah, and yeah. I, I, I think the best advice we've had, I think, in a, in a long time was from our, our mentor. Mm. Yeah, our, our mentor, Tim, has told us that you've got to have strategy. You've got to have a plan of attack, a plan for everything. It's just got to be there because if you don't, yeah. you turn up un, unprepared, yeah. you're going to be, showing, be you're showing your ass real quick, right? Don't be making beer that hasn't already been sold. Have a demand for the product before you start pumping it out. Otherwise, mm. you're just going to be surrounded by beer going out of date. Mm. Yes. And uh, come down and drink our beer. <laughs> well, that's uh, yeah. yeah. So yeah. Any, anything you guys I would like to flood? We, we might be um, talking to crickets at the moment. We, I don't know, but um, anything you guys would like to plug right now? Uh, the brewery bar or tap house is open every day until Christmas Day and we close down and then we're open every day after that. Yeah. Um, 20 taps. 20 um, taps. Seven or two, two, four are doubled up. So we we'll say 17 taps of different beer. Um, we do a bunch of IPAs. We've got, um, we'll be doing a sour in the works. Uh, really some, two different lagers. Yeah. Like, I'm, yeah, I'm locking in Nipro at the moment. Yeah, the meat is going down. And your well. pills, no, I just had was yeah. Yeah, very nice. Uh, yeah, it's a you know we've got a lot of really good beer coming out here. And the hangman tasted even better. Yeah, our pala, so you know, uh, big boy. Yeah, I think we still got a riz on the bar as well oh, at the moment. So, oh. and we make the best burgers in the city. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, and we'll be keeping a dark beer on all summer for those dark beer lovers who get bummed out when no one puts dark beers on for them. Yeah, well, it's summertime. It's all the, all about yeah, section and yeah. lawnmowers. You but can't forget those dark beers. Nah, because there's always going to be a punter that wants to. Yeah, we got two. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, thanks again, guys. I appreciate no you letting us come out and see the brewery, and uh, we'll leave it at that. Awesome. Fantastic. Cheers. Thanks for listening to the Build Me a Brewery podcast, and I do hope you enjoyed today's episode. Please remember to like, follow or subscribe across all our social media handles and if you visit our website www.billmeabrewery.com.au and subscribe to our mailing list, you can get exclusive content such as free ebooks and transcripts on all our podcast episodes. So keep on listening and stay tuned for more episodes of the Bill Me A Brewery podcast. Yeah.